Well, we started a series on created in him for good works, which is to say things that God wants for us to do. We're to be active and doing in life, working um, earnest in his vineyard. And um, we look today at the parable of the talents as recorded in Matthew, but talking about created in him for good works, we look at some high-level verses, such as Ecclesiastes 11, verse 4, which says, He who observes the wind will not sow, and he who regards the clouds will not reap, which is fairly clear that we're not trying to judge the time, we're trying to do the work. And if you're waiting for the perfect time, the perfect time never comes, and it won't be done. So I've got to have more of the uh, maybe brave, maybe positive, uh, um, affirmative, we will be doing. You also have Galatians 6 talking about the fact that we will be rewarded in due season. Let us not grow weary of doing good, Galatians 6, 9 says. For in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So we have to be tenacious. We have to understand that maybe we have to wait for that payout, that maybe some things going on here are not too happy or won't be so great. But in due season we will reap. A little patience there, a little perseverance there, and a promise from God that it won't be unjust in the end. God will Remember the work that you have done. And we add to it from recent lessons what was recorded about Hezekiah, who was healed from a terminal illness, given 15 extra years to live, and unfortunately did not make return according to the benefit done to him, which stands as a warning to us. We've been given something, and uh, we're to be using that thing So the first thing is, we look at the text, it's Matthew 25, and um, we'll take the first part of this, not the entirety, but uh, verses 14 through 19. If you'll consider it with me briefly, then we'll go on to some discussion of the things that are evident in these verses. It's Matthew 25, verses 14 to 19. Where Jesus says this parable, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away, and he who had received the first, or yeah, the five talents, excuse me, went at once and traded with them, and he made five talents more. So also he who had the two talents made two talents more. But he who had received the one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. And after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. Well, this is the first part in which the master entrusts his property to them. He said the kingdom is like this, meaning the church is like this. Being, being a Christian is like this. Well, in the 14th verse of Matthew 25, he said it will be like a man going on a journey. So the first comparison is, this is the master of the house. He's, he has these servants that work for him. He's apparently very wealthy. He has a lot of material goods and uh, is going on a journey, which is to say, he's coming back. <laughs> It seems like he's gone, but only for a minute, if you will. You know, he's going on a journey, not dying, not going away. He's coming back. Is the implication of he's going on a journey is he's going to be returning at some point. And, um, you know, this is before airlines. Um, not that our schedules are especially reliable these days, but um, 
more so than would have been in the ancient world when you take a journey, there really is no telling how long it's gonna be, what day or what week somebody's gonna come back, maybe not even in what month. I'm told that it's this way in the modern world in some places. But he's going, he's gonna come back is the idea. This is not, uh, this is a temporary situation here. For a time, we're entrusted with his property and he's going to be back. And what do you think will happen when he comes back? <laughs> you know he's coming back, but what do you think will happen then, right? This is implied. The other thing it says there at verse 14 is, he entrusted to them his property. It's his property, not theirs, but they've been entrusted with it. It's been given into their hands to use it, to protect it, to grow it, to make something of it. How should they do this? Well, you know, maybe the smarter ones would have taken this as, it, I need to act in his stead. You know, what would the master do with this sum of money? Um, how would the master handle this thing that has been given. Um, and that would be a good way to think about it. The fact is that we as Christians, we have what belongs to God. <laughs> um, even though we are granted to exert some amount of influence over it for the time, it belongs to God. Our lives belong to God. Um, you know, the produce of the earth belongs to God. Every good blessing that we have, every ability we have, all the money, the food, you know, the friends, the connections, the opportunities, you know, it, it all belongs to God. We're, you know, we're servants in his world. And if these things have been granted into our hands, well, we've been entrusted with his property. And it implies it implies that we're supposed to do something with it. It's his, we've been entrusted with it for a period of time, which let's call our lives. But there's a point coming when the master returns in the parable in our lives. That's either the Lord returns as predicted um, at a time when nobody knows, or we walk the veil with him. And one of those things will happen relatively soon, fewer than 70 years, most likely. So we have a period of time during which we are allowed to exert some influence over the master's property. And that does imply something, doesn't it? We know he's coming back. We know it belongs to him, not to me, but I'm his servant and he trusted me with this. I should feel responsible about that. I should feel like, okay, this is, this is a wonderful thing and I can use it. I can turn it into something. I can get something for the master. The 15th verse talks about talents to one he gave five, to another two, to another one, according to his ability. And this is one of those things where the word talent um, has more than one meaning. In English, um, this does not mean talent like I can play the flute or I know how to tap dance. <laughs> Neither of which I, I have, those are not my talents. Um, this is a specific technical term, talent. It's a unit of money in the ancient world. And it's not a dollar and it's not a C note. <laughs> Uh, a talent is something like today's terms, about a half million U.S. dollars. It's a very large sum of money. It's not, you know, when we say, well, one's got five talents. He can, uh, he can preach and he can lead singing and he can lead. No, that's not, those are, that's the wrong talent. 
That's in the tap dancing and flute playing category. This is money. He's been given five talents, which is what? That's like $2.5 million. Who is left, you know, in charge of two and a half million dollars? That's what we're talking about. And then the two talent man, well, he's got a million ish. But even the one talent man has hundreds of thousands of dollars, at least 350, probably more like 500 in today's terms. It's not $500, it's not $5,000, not $50,000, $500,000 is the one talent man. And you know, maybe that's nothing to you, maybe you have that in the bank and it's just no issue for you, but uh, to me anyway, that's a large sum of money. Something that you don't you know, put under your mattress, you do something with that, that, that can actually accomplish things for you. So I want to make that clear. And the reason for saying this is not um, to be pedantic, although I am disposed to being pedantic. Um, the reason is our lives, no matter how small they seem, are very valuable. That's the point. <laughs> Even the one talent man has a great deal of value at his disposal. No matter how insignificant we may think we are, or how little influence we may think we have, it's actually tremendously valuable, and it can be used in service of the master. You have enough to work with. You have enough to do something with it. It also said in the 15th verse that he gave one five, another two, another one, and the reason he did that was to each according to his ability. And, you know, too often it's read as, well, you know, I just can't do that. I won't be held accountable for things I can't do. Well, it's true that you won't be held accountable for things that you can't do, but it's also true that you would likely underestimate what you can do. You can probably do more than you think you can. Uh, and these who have been given talents, you know, you're giving someone two and a half million, a million and five hundred thousand dollars. You know, these are all of them quite able managers. If your budget is five hundred thousand. You're a pretty important manager. And certainly the two and a half million, that's a big guy. But I mean, $500,000 uh, uh, budget, that, that's a pretty important manager there. That's somebody who is trusted, somebody who is capable. When we say according to his ability, we don't mean, oh, that guy can barely do anything because he only has one talent. No, he only has one unit of half a million dollars. <laughs> he's still a big fish in a big pond, or he's a little fish, but he's in a big pond. <laughs> according to his ability, we're, they're all quite able. It's not a small sum. Again, this underscores what we were saying, that none of our lives are insignificant. None of us have an influence that is insignificant, unimportant, intangible. That's not the case. You exert an influence. You mean something, whether you realize it or not, and uh, are capable of effecting change in your environment even in the lives of people around you. But yes, according to his ability, is still true that sometimes people have far greater resources at their disposal or they have a um, very different set of opportunities available to them um, based on you know, who they are, who they're born to, where they live, when they live. <laughs> uh, all this kind of stuff. And I dare say that these are um, not really intended to be, uh, you know, confined to a, a single person, a single life. Like, your life is a one-talent life, and my life is a five-talent life. Like, I don't think it's that. I think it's talking about different ways of looking at things. Um, you know, the, the, the older person living in... Uh, in, in solitude may not have as many contacts outside of the home as the younger person who is in college or in school. 
And so maybe the younger person is five talents in the sense of the ability to reach people who have never heard this before. And yet, obviously, the older person who is living in solitude is the five talent person when it comes to wisdom, where the younger person in school is more like the one talent. I think it's more about our situation. It, it, it's whatever you know, economy you're talking about, if you will, to, to continue that metaphor. But to each according to his ability is to say, God's not going to uh, expect something that you cannot do. But he may expect more than you think. That's the issue. The other thing it said in the 15th verse is then he went away. The master's going on a journey, brings us the, the, probably the three best managers he has, gives them their budgets, you know, according to their ability, and then he goes away. Which is our lives. We live, we make choices. And, you know, the atheist is always talking about, well, I called on God to strike me with lightning, and he didn't. That means he doesn't exist. No. <laughs> it means that he's patient. It means that he's kind, that he's not willing for any to perish. That's what it means. But people think that payment in this life is, you know, the thing that shows. Well, it's not. The fact is, in, in some sense, our lives here, we're left... You know, in some measure, not to, be, to put it too severely, but we're left to our own devices in a sense. We're allowed to make choices, including bad choices. We're being tested. On the one hand, the other thing I would say is there's a word immediately, which happens right here at the end of verse 15 or at the beginning of verse 16. And it really is, it could go either way. So maybe what this means is he went away immediately, which would have the intent or would have the, um, I guess, would have the impact of suddenly. You know, you can see the servants like, well, oh, we were summoned and we were given this budget. And then, oh, oh, he's gone. <laughs> you know, and you can see this. Oh, what did he say again? <laughs> Uh, maybe I should have written that down while he was still here. <laughs> I hope I get it right. When is he coming back? You know, that's not where you want to be, right? <laughs> well, we have the Bible. It tells us how to live. It tells us what to do, right? We have the rules. We know what's expected of us on the one hand. On the other hand, um, if this one went at once or immediately, this one who received the five talents traded with them. If you want to say that the immediacy goes with that person, well then what we're saying is that this man uh, was the one who proved especially eager and willing to do the work of the master. He'd been given a charge, he'd been given a, a, you know, a budget, the master took off and he got to work immediately, no delay here, no delay in doing what belongs to the master. So this man gets it, right? It, it, in his mind, he doesn't have a choice. It's the master's, and the master's gone, and he has to act to the best of his ability like the master in the master's stead while he's out. So he needs to get busy, and he needs to work, and he needs to get started. And when it comes to, you know, money, especially, you know, two and a half million dollars, the financial people, and I'm not one of them, but I believe them, they say time is the most important metric or the most important uh, ingredient in the growth of money. <laughs> time, because of compound interest, whatever else. That, you know. Starting soon is the way to make a return on the far end. The biggest return on the far end comes from starting right now. Or as the Japanese say, the best time to plant a tree was 50 years ago. <laughs> the second best time is right now. 
It's another way of saying the same thing. This man did not wait. He got immediately to work doing the master's work. He immediately started using what had been granted to him to do. And that's right. That's the way it should be. What are you waiting for as a Christian, right? What, what else needs to be done? Aren't you set? God has given you salvation. God has given you forgiveness. God has given you the Bible. God has given you your brothers and sisters who love you. You know, let's get busy. Let's do the work. And, the, you know, the two-talent man did the same. So differing abilities, but the same metric of work. The one talent man, we're told in the 18th verse, one who had received the one talent, went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Put $500,000 in a hole in the ground. Well, how did he do this is the real question. If this is going to be applicable to us, we have to think about, well, how did, he, how did you get here? I mean, what is the, you know, what's the thinking here? And what we're saying, what we're seeing is this man ha had a way of thinking about this. He had the same, um, I guess, stewardship, right, that, that the master's property was entrusted to him. And he had to use that wisely. But the other two went and traded with it and, and made more money. This one dug a hole in the ground. Why did he do this? What is the, the planning in his mind? What is he, you know, what's he thinking that this is the best way to steward that money? Um. There's a lot of things that seem like planning, and they seem like foresight and forethought and, you know, safety. Um, you got, like, maybe he's working on this before he does this, you know, this hole in the ground where it's going to hide. He, he's... First, he has to pick the right spot to do that. So maybe he observes the foot traffic in the area. Maybe he looks for a piece of property that's, that's privately owned, and maybe the owner never visits it or is incapable of walking around on the land. Uh, it's not sown, so nobody ever goes there. You know, he, he's gone to a lot of trouble to find the right spot in the ground to go put this money. Maybe um, he's thinking it has to be put into uh, an appropriate kind of chest or container. We want, you know, it won't do for that thing to, uh, you know, to crumble or to be crushed under the weight of the dirt and rock on top of it. We need to make sure it's made of the best kind of wood or maybe steel. And, well, they wouldn't have had steel, but you know what I mean, some kind of metal. And... Uh, Maybe, you know, we have to be concerned about moisture. They, there could be a bag or something, you know, maybe, the, or uh, maybe some cotton or I don't know. I don't know what they would have had in those, in those days, but, you know, that would be good thinking about what if it rains. Uh, well, that's part of finding the right spot. You don't want it to be down where the water collects and it's always being subject to moisture because you don't want that money to get destroyed. Um, Oh, and what happens if uh, something happens to me and this thing is hidden somewhere and the master comes back? Well, I, we need to make a map to where the treasure is buried. There, there needs to be a map. Um, we need to share that map with others. Um, you know, you, you, you call these things disaster recovery or redundance in uh, business terms, business continuity. So uh, we make sure that there's a map in, in the possession of some other person who is not here, who doesn't live where I live. So if there's a natural disaster that kills me, he's not subject to that, and he'll have the map, and they can still go find the money. And, of course, the map has to—we don't know how long the master's going to be, so we need to make sure the map is laminated, 
can withstand all of the moisture. Right? You see what's happening. It, it's all, what is it? It's all busy work. It's all busy work. It's all of it not using the money. That's what's happening. It's busy work. It seems like good stewardship, but it's not. It's a failure to do what God wants you to do. That's what's happening. That's not good stewardship. Good stewardship is take that money out there and use it and make a return to the master with it. That's good stewardship. Burying it in the ground, coming up with the best way to keep bad things from happening to it while it sits there and does nothing. That's not good stewardship at all. That's the problem. He's thinking all about risk. He's thinking all about fear. And he's, you know, missing the biggest threat that faces that money. <laughs> right? The biggest threat that faces a sum of money that large is that there will be no return on it. Because it's enough to weather a storm. It's enough to weather a bad market. It can be done. You know, real, like I said, a real concern for what happens when the master comes back would be, well, the master expects a return. I need to find a way to make a return. This, you know, it's, it might be worse than this, right? This servant might be thinking, well, I just don't want to use it. I don't, I don't want to use it. It's too risky. I don't trust myself. I'm not confident in my abilities. You know, or, or I might lose it. And I have nothing to show for it in the end. But, you know, the master entrusted it to him. So was the master wrong? To give that to you? Should he not have given you the opportunities that you have? Was he wrong to do that? He, he, he misjudged your abilities and, and, and what you could handle? I don't think we should think that way. I think God knows us quite well and, and he knows what we can do and has given us his son Jesus. But again, the, the overriding problem of this, you know, burying this sum of money is that a return was never possible. No matter how good a location he picked out, no matter how good a container he picked out, no matter how good his redundancy, um, you know, treasure map and planning were, the one thing that would never result from any of that effort was a return on that money. It would never earn anything. He guaranteed it would never earn anything by burying it and refusing to use it. That's the deal, the worst part about that. He took what belonged to the master and was enough to make more for the master and actually prevented it from doing anything for the master. That practically amounts to stealing. And the 19th verse said, after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. After a long time. Which is our lives, right? It's what we're saying. We will give an account at the end of our lifetime for what we are doing. We don't know how long that is, but, you know, it's the longest thing we'll ever do. But when it comes to you know, investments, when it comes to interest, when it comes to, you know, finances and management, the longer, the worse. If it's sitting there not being used, if it's not garnering any interest, if it's not being invested, the longer, the worse. The longer it sits there stagnant, the, you know, the further behind it is. Uh, the five-talent man and the two-talent man each succeeded in doubling what was given to them. And no, the two-talent man didn't make five talents. 
but he doubled what he was given. And that's also what the five talent man did. He doubled what he was given. This one talent man, if he had doubled what he had been given, he would have become the two talent man <laughs> that we started with. But, you know, as his sits in the ground, doing nothing, garnering nothing, the others are outpacing him by a large margin. They're doubling over the period of time that the master is gone. So, and, and that's the way it is. The longer that is, the worse it becomes because, you know, compound interest is exponential over time. It's not a straight line graph over the years. It becomes a massive difference. And the question becomes, well, how long does God have to give me before I realize it's time? <laughs> it's time to act. It's time to do this. How much time is left to, to do this and get the return that's necessary? Um, it's, again, the finance people tell me those, those short-term things are the smallest return. If you have something you're gonna call in two years, three years, four years, that's gonna be a very small percentage. If you have something you won't call for 15 years, it'll be higher. But even better, if you're not gonna call it for 30 years, it'll be a much, that's the highest rate of return available. That's why they tell you to start saving for retirement as soon as you start working as a teenager or 20 something because that gives you your 30 year highest return yield for when you are retiring, blah, 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 blah. I believe them, I think they're probably right, but don't take my advice on finances. The point is the illustration. The longer, the worse. The longer it sits there, the farther behind it is. The others are growing exponentially faster. We have to wake up with enough time and what will waiting accomplish? Well, it's a good question. What will waiting accomplish? I mean, I, nothing really. <laughs> uh, it's just lost time. It's not going to succeed in doing anything. Now, nobody's talking about, you know, acting hastily. Um, I've found when I was a manager that I couldn't make instant decisions. I had to wait. I had to say, okay, I understand what you're saying. I understand the stakes. I'll answer you tomorrow. Because that's just how it worked for me. I couldn't be Johnny on the spot. I had to think about it overnight and there would be clarity for me tomorrow. And then I would answer it. Anything that I answered on the spot, I usually got wrong. <laughs> But you know, tomorrow or in the morning is very different from, you know, well, one day, yeah, one day never comes. So we're not talking about haste, but we're talking about diligence, you know, um, importance, presence of mind, um, emphasis. You know, we, we have to get God's work done. We need to do it at the next opportunity here, which shouldn't be very far away. That should characterize my thinking on this. And again, at the 19th verse, it was after a long time, but the master of the servants came back from his journey, as anticipated. And when he came back, he settled accounts with them. You know, yeah. He came back, did we throw a party? Well, maybe we did, but what he really wanted was to get down to business, settle accounts. <laughs> How has it gone with my fortune while I have been gone? I picked you guys, right? I picked you because I knew what you were capable of and I entrusted to you what was appropriate that you could take and do something with. 
So when I come back, I want to settle those accounts. Um, this word for settling accounts that occurs here in Matthew 25, verse 19, is also the word that is used for gathering a harvest, gathering in a harvest. So it fits really well with all the other parables where the, the, Jesus is the Lord of the harvest. And, you know, the end time comes, it's the time of the harvest. You know, and we think of our own lives in this way. It fits really well like that. He's coming back and it's time. This is now settling. We're, we're harvesting. We're, we're done. We're bringing it all up. Let's see what we got. Let's count this. What is that? Well, it's the judgment. We will be judged by the Lord, either when he returns at a time nobody knows, or when the judgment day comes after we have left this earth, after we are no longer walking among the living. <coughs> um, it's the same settling accounts that occurs in Matthew 18, verse 23, uh, where one of the stewards, or uh, I'm sorry, yeah, one of the stewards owed a, a tremendous debt to his master that he could never repay, remember that kind of thing. He was settling accounts with that guy. It's interesting there because there the, ta the talent uh, in that parable is a debt that he owes that he couldn't possibly repay. And the debt that we owe, of course, is sin. And in the case of the debt of sin, what we forgive, what we ourselves forgive in our fellow servants has a lot to do with what the master will forgive us of. That's an interesting way of looking at it. We take that, you know, and put it here. Well, this is to say God has given me something and what I've used it for is a measure of what will be done for me. At harvest time, what will my share be? So, all right, we're gonna we're gonna hit pause there and come back to this parable at another opportunity. But these are, again, these are aimed at the big picture verses that we started with. Hezekiah had been entrusted with 15 additional years of life, but did not succeed in making any return with it. It didn't go like the first 15 years of his reign, the second 15 years. It didn't go like that. He did not make a return. That's unfortunate. Galatians tells us we must not grow weary of doing. We'll reap in due season if we persist. And again, Ecclesiastes warns in 11.4 11, of Ecclesiastes, he who observes the wind will not sow, he who regards the clouds will not reap. That's the place we don't want to be. Find ourselves with the harvest time upon us and we didn't sow, nor have we reaped. Oh. The Lord willing, we'll come back to this and finish up the parable of the talents, but that's good for now. Appreciate your kind attention. And it's worth taking an inventory of our own lives. Every one of us individually should be thinking about what am I doing for God? And what has God entrusted to me? And where are the opportunities? I don't say this to, you know, we ought to be beating ourselves up or we ought to be passive aggressive with one another. I'm saying, look at what God has entrusted to me. I can do this. Let's think about what can we do? What can I do that will make a return to God? How can we turn this into something for God? And you think in these terms, you think more, if you will, positively. You think more uh, kind of brave if you will, but may, are bold, perhaps, a certain confidence. But we have a boldness and a confidence to enter the throne room of grace by the blood of Jesus, who inaugurated 
a new and living way into the holiest of holies with his own sacrifice of himself. Our confidence is not so much placed in ourselves as in the one who entrusted these things to us. Now, if he gave this to me, he expects that I can handle it, even if I don't think so, or I didn't think so. I now think I do because God's right. All right. So what are we going to do with this? That's the way to think. How are we going to make a return on this? What can we make out of that? And pray. Ask God to help you to know what to do or where to make that return or how to reach that person or whatever it is. But be busy about that. Have that idea that you're working for God and God has given you a lot of things. And he has. If today you're not a Christian, especially God has given his son Jesus that you might be forgiven. You've got to put Jesus on in baptism for forgiveness of sins once you've repented. Put God first and decide the master has to be served, not the self. And that starts by being baptized in the name of Christ for forgiveness. We have water prepared for you to do this if that is your need. Today, if you are a Christian and you need prayers of the saints, we are glad to pray with you. We all need prayers, honestly. So there's no shame or fear in that at all. Let us know. We're glad to help you as Christians. We're here to help one another on to heaven. If you need the prayers of the saints, you need to obey the gospel. Let the need be known now by coming to the front while together we stand and sing the song selected. <laughs>